chairing the afternoon session, which is really a celebration of all things RDA, um, and a bit of an exploration as well. So we are going to be kicking off with a panel, um, who, which is going to be chaired by a former RDA trustee, a former British Equestrian Foundation trustee, and international swimmer, Jess Cook. Um, to explore the future of equestrianism and the role that the RDA can play in that. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello everyone, it's lovely to be back. Um, I only left the RDA board in September, but it feels like it was a sunny long ago. <laughs> so it's really nice to kind of be here and see some familiar faces. We've got an absolutely fantastic panel in front of me, and I hope that this afternoon, over the next hour and a half, we will get some really good insight for you. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each of the panel members to introduce themselves independently. You'll then hear some research that has been done by the BEF, and then we'll get down to the nitty gritty bits. So uh, bear with us while we kind of see where we're going and what's happening, or just to make sure everyone's mic'd up, and we go. So now Mandana's got a mic, shall we start there? Yes. Hi everyone, uh, so glad to be here amongst you amazing, lovely people. My name is Mandana. I am the Head of Participation and Development for British Equestria. Um, just a little bit about me and my personal background. I am Iranian. I was born in Tehran, Iran, um, in a Muslim country, which is not always an easy place to live as a woman. Um, and I used to be a professional athlete for about 20 years. Um, my sport uh, was basketball. And I was fortunate enough to um, have sports in my life from a very young age. I'm coming from a sporting family and they provided me with everything that I needed. And sports made me who I am today. Uh, I'm confident because of the sports. I have a lot of friends uh, because of the sports. And I am who I am uh, sitting here because of the opportunities I have. And I love to live in a world, I know it's a bit of a blue sky thinking, but I love to live in a world where everyone has the opportunity to play uh, sports and take part in activities and for, for here, relevant to this audience, for an amazing equestrian <coughs> sport that is very unique in lots of different ways. So really happy to be here. Tegan, do you want to let, uh, say hello, introduce yourself and let everybody know how you found RDA? Yeah, so I'm Tegan. And I am a part of this last rider. Um, I initially started riding at RDA when I was four years old, very short. Um, and it was suggested because I had to do physiotherapy when I was that young. But I just preferred to let go into the gym and do stretches and all that. So my physiotherapist suggested RDA. And we didn't know what that was, we didn't know what it entailed, but when we went and I sat on a horse, or on a pony for the first time, I fell in love with the sport and I kind of never stopped. I, yeah, married my whole life, so. And then over the last few years, I've become a power British dressage athlete. And I'm training for hopefully the Paralympics in the future. Susanna, um, lots of you know me, I, I think I've got uh, several different points of, of reference for us today. Um, my original sport was carriage driving, uh, I was part of British carriage driving and I became their um, lead safeguarding officer because I think I couldn't keep my mouth shut at the AGM. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so I seem to know a bit more about it than their current safeguarding officer, so they asked me if I would do it and that's back in the turning their period. Um, wind forward a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I realised there's something called uh, riding for disabled, which uh, a long-standing friend of mine, um, Lindsay Korea, is over there somewhere, uh, one of your trustees, said, oh yeah, I'm on here as well, okay, I'll come, come and do that. So I started off with a riding group, moved on to a carriage driving group, where I could be a little bit more um, useful to, you, to us, um, and I'm now a, a, a carriage driving coach. Um, with a background, um, I, I made my living out of employment law, um, but I'm not a solicitor, I'm one of these old industrial relations people millions and millions of years ago. Um, and some of you um, may have, have known my wife, Jill, who uh, chaired our education committee for a very short period of time and, until her <coughs> untimely death um, in uh, 2017. When I decided, and here's my link into the 
um, diversity side of, of, of us, um, I decided I could not live on as a man anymore. I never liked the word. Um, gender dysphoria has always been strong in me, but I've always hidden it. So I decided I was going to transition. And so I became Susanna, and that's just over four years ago. So this is a quite new um, trans woman. And I have had the most wonderful welcome and support from RDA. Also from British Carriage Driving, who simply noted it. Yes, OK, our safeguarding officer is now uh, Susanna. Everyone OK? Yeah, 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 good, that's it. Friends and neighbours. Uh, I thought, where are all these trans haters? I've had so much support. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, no, I'm going to bring that forward. I'm going to talk about it. I'm not going to hide away and pretend I'm someone else. I am that one, and I've now changed it to this one. And so um, a combination of, of, of that, plus knowing Lindsay, she thought, mm -hmm. I've got to get the uh, EDI uh, agenda raised um, here. I was already on the British Equestrians equivalent group, chaired by Jess. Um, and I have very recently been uh, voted onto the board of British Equestrian, um, following Jess's very, very successful tenure as a, as a board director there as well. And I'll be part of our little EDI working party here, and some of you know me from that, um, including <laughs> the inaugural session, um, just to test how it went. And so I'm, I'm sort of deeply involved with us um, on the equality, diversity, inclusion world. Um, and uh, I, I echo everything that Helen has said, how surprisingly wonderful uh, you all are. So, okay, that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much. And finally, but no minds may be blue. Um, and can you introduce yourself? Because you've got quite an interesting story as to how you found the RDA. So it'll be nice to hear that now. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, you know, sitting here, I must say that I'm so jealous of Susanna because of her style. So I think. Um, <laughs> I've become a friend and she'll be telling me when she's getting all these lovely clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I love lovely clothes, yeah. But I think I'm the only one here who doesn't have um, a background with horses. Um, yeah, I am um, a Paralympian. I sat on the UK Athletics Board for quite a number of years until last year. I was the only black person to be on a funded, government funded um, a sporting organization that is until last year. And so now I sit on the on the BP, which is the British Paralympic Association, um, as a director, and I'm also on my local NHS at Trust, Princess Alexander Hospital, as an associate director. But, you know, my life has changed. And I, you know, I want to tell people that I've just found a new aunt, and this is with the, with horses. And the first thing that you know that that really attracted me was you know just the feel of you know like when you touch the horse, you know the velvet touch, you know, but also the the poo, you know the smell of the poo, <laughs> because because it is so natural. It is so, it, I'm, I'm originally from from Kenya. And you know, when I was growing up, it was really, uh, I was born in a mud hut. And the mud hut used to be decorated with cow poo, which is different from horse poo. <laughs> you know, horse poo is more fresh, you know. But, um, just a few months ago, I met a lovely lady, uh, Sarah Jane. She's, she's here with, with, with me today. And Sarah Jane is, a, is one of the volunteers um, at the Brook Cotton Farm. And, she sort of said, oh, let's go and watch Polo. And I was like, oh, that is for the posh people. Mm -hmm. But then I went along and, oh my goodness, I was so amazed to go and just touch the horses, you know, feel their velvety, you know, nose and, you know, and when they make that sound, you know, <laughs> and I was like, this is something different and this is something special. So I went along, really, I wanted to sit on a horse. I haven't actually ridden a horse. But they managed to sit me, you know, but let me tell you what happened. I am a polio survivor, and when I sat on the horse, oh my goodness, I felt the warm, you know. I, I felt some kind of warm on my bum and, you know, stuff like that. And I really want to continue having that experience so that I can actually finally get to ride. But just a few weeks ago, Hester, you know, the book, uh, the book called Trambe, actually helped me um, ride, you know, horse carriage riding, 
and that was exceptional. Mm. And Bruce the horse and Frank, mm -hmm. you know, was helping me. I just most adorable people. And I, I think to me, when I sit here today, I want to say that my name is Anne Wafula Strike. I identify as disabled. You know, I'm not just disabled. I identify as disabled, mm -hmm. but I think that is irrelevant. What, what is what is relevant, really, uh, Jess, is the opportunities that we get in life to sort of like thrive and sort of just sort of like be, you know, be members, be really full members of our community or our society. So I'm just grateful to be born in this family, the Horsey family. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, and I think that's a really brilliant point about the fact that every one of us here wants fairness in whichever way we can get it, whether that's in society, in the workplace, being able to ride, sitting on a horse, touching a horse, driving a carriage, it doesn't matter, we just want to be able to have the fairness that comes with that. So, apart from the fact I'm not entirely sure how we can follow smelling poo, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Amanda if she can um, speak to us about some research that the EES has done called Horses for All. And it was looking at, um, the idea of it was to look at EDI in the broader respect, but that's so big, we kind of decided that we needed to really cut it down and we specifically got it into ethnic diverse communities and low social and economic groupings. So we really felt today was a fairly good kind of um, place for you to hear about it. And I will stop talking and Amanda can take it from here. Thank you, Jess. Um, I think what you mentioned here is really interesting. It's about um, sense of belonging, all of us uh, feeling that um, the behaviour of people against us is fair. And we are talking about equality, equity, diversity and inclusion today, but it's not just um, people from different demographics or the different background to us. It's about everyone, regardless of their colour of their face. Um, everyone likes to feel that they are included, so it's relevant to everyone. Um, today I want to cover why inclusion in sport is important. Um, I will talk about the journey across the NFL system and have taken across um, uh, equality diversity landscape. I'll touch on a little bit uh, quickly on the challenges we have uh, faced along the way, the learning we have taken, and finish with where we are now and um, where we are planning to get to. I wanted to start by saying I hope um, everyone agrees with me here that everyone has the, should have the chance to shine and we all have a role to play in that. And I just put these quotes up, I don't know how many of you can read them, but these are some of the quotes we had from uh, our Horses for All research. Um, it was a very long document, it was a very lengthy uh, research in terms of times, and a lot of disheartening information came back to us. But at the same time, a lot of positives as well. And what I want to say here before I go to the presentation on the horses for all is um, we all have a role to play in this. It's, it's our collective responsibility to create a welcoming environment for everyone to be part of our society. And it might mean different things for different people. For some of us, it might mean that uh, we have the courage to stand up and speak out. For some, it might mean that listening with patience and not being uh, like agitating to respond, just just listen and not listen to respond, listen to understand, and ensuring everyone feels they are involved, as I mentioned earlier. So, just to give a bit of a context, um, sporting sector is on a journey to tackle inequalities in sport and it means different things for different sports. So I'm going to go through uh, where we are good at as an equestrian sport, which you all of you know, but I'm going to reference them anyway, to then say why we have focused on our audience. The active strategy, which was the government strategy, came out in September, focusing on some uh, specific targets on where they want the whole nation to go in terms of tackling inequalities under, uh, under representation. 
And you know, I think a movement strategy was also another strategy which is out there. Uh, it's a 10 year strategy, tackling inequality sits uh, underneath everything they are doing at the moment. So it's very important for the whole sector. I'm not sure how many of you can read this, but I wanted to highlight what we are, what we're doing that is quite well and uh, put us in a unique position as a sport. Um, there are a few areas um, that I just want to highlight here. One of them is gender. Um, as a sport equestrian, stand as a beacon of gender equality. Uh, not only the fact that um, men and women can uh, compete at equal terms, but Having over 85% of our participants at grassroots level from a, a, a female background puts us at the same level as netball, which is a sport for women. So we are really strong in that landscape. It gets a little bit more balanced when we go to the performance, so there's a bit of work to do in that, but at grassroots we're really good. The other one is age. Um, People can be involved in a question irrespective of their age. You can start riding from a very young age and well into your 70s and 80s that this is something that you all know much better than I do. In terms of trans community, um, because the question isn't gender segregated, um, there is no requirement to identify or test for a specific gender for competing in a question, uh, which is an area that is a lot of other sports in landscape are really struggling at the moment to create that balanced environment for trans people to, to uh, participate in sports. However, there is more that we should do to better understand how welcoming our industry is in terms of LGBTQ plus communities. And it was great to hear Susanna's story and we love to hear more about those stories and see if actually we are really good in welcoming people from those backgrounds. And disability is really relevant to this room um, due to the nature of our sport, but more importantly, for the work of the organisations like yourself, we are representative of the society in terms of disability participation, both um, in terms of participating in sports, but also at the talent level. However, we lack representation from people from ethnically diverse communities, so that's more around race and, and religion and those backgrounds, as well as people from low socioeconomic backgrounds, so people who live in deprived area might not necessarily be able to afford our sport. We know this poses a challenge for us if we want to focus on those two areas. Um, and I want to highlight a few reasons why. Uh, we are predominantly a rural sport, which means that ethnicity is not as high. It's more um, higher in the inner city area. So that's one of the challenges we have in terms of diversity. Um, the map on the left hand side, you can see there, it shows where we have a lot of issues in terms of riding school capacities. And I know it's the same in terms of RDA groups. We have a long waiting list for a lot of people who are interested to take up our sports, but unfortunately there's no space for them to go to. And the other point I was going to mention is we know there's a lot of good work being done in pockets of our society, like in inner cities where you can see in that photo there are horses in the middle of tower blocks in, in the middle of London where you don't really expect to see a horse. So there's a lot of good work being done in pockets of our industry, but we don't collect the data to be able to understand how good we are in those places. We know diversity in our sports is important because we believe diversity drives empathy, diversity creates sense of belonging and diversity means that we are going to be more innovative because we're going to have more diversity of thought. So we've done research to better understand the barriers to participate in our sport. We have done an independent research called Horses for All. It was a company, a research agency called AKD Solution who conducted this research on our behalf and on behalf of the Federation members. We did it independently because we wanted to make sure that um, we keep transparency and openness for people we are going to them. And because of the background of those organizations, we were sure that um, they can relate and create that sense of um, safety with our audience that we wanted to target. 
The research looked at barriers to equestrian from grassroots level up to the elite level, and we wanted to better, better understand how we can improve. We made the conscious decision to go to people from equestrian background. So we didn't only go to people who are not involved in our industry to understand why they're not and what we should do to make it better. We went to people from equestrian background because we wanted to learn from the experiences they had. We wanted to know what have we done that was really good that we should continue, what we could have done in their journey to make it easier for them. But more importantly, we wanted to give them a voice and a platform for, for them to talk about their experiences and the challenges they have. There are some, so this is just a data slide just to show you um, the, the, the audience we have engaged with. So I know probably a lot of you are not um, as interested as I am in data and numbers, so I'm just going to move on quickly from this slide. Um, this is a slide that shows the barriers to participation that came out from the research. So those are the key themes. In one side, we see the um, areas that was highlighted by people from equestrian background, and the other is from non-equestrian background. The research highlighted areas around affordability of our sport, exclusivity of our sport, lack of diversity, lack of awareness, as well as some positive themes around courses for health and happiness. And one of the very interesting points was um, we took most of those 100, about 150 people went through an experience day. They never ever been into a, a riding school or haven't been near a horse. Over 95% of them loved it. They all want to come back and they all wanted to find a way to see how they can engage with our sport which is incredibly positive. If a lot of other sports would have had the waiting list we have, or would have had the latent demand our sports have, I, I just don't know what, what they would have done. Uh, imagine if um, Boots have a store where there is um, a lot of people coming to it, so the demand is getting high, they just open another store. And unfortunately for our sports, it's not as simple as that. So we have a really good latent demand that was really highlighted in here. I just wanted to mention a few of those areas here, and I'm pulling up some of the quotes here. So these are the areas that are related in demand that I mentioned that um, some of them, a lady from a Muslim background was really happy to find a place where they could go and be herself with her job. Um, there are others who live in the inner city and um, they are not sure where they want to go. So I, one of the areas that was really clearly highlighted, which I'm not sure if it's the same with RGA groups or not, there was a lot of um, lack of awareness of where people, local riding schools were. Some of them live like less than two miles from the riding school, but it was tucked away in an area that they never knew that existed. So that was one of the areas that um, I wanted to highlight. Lack of pathways and opportunities was highlighted, both from a um, people from equestrian background and people from non-equestrian background. So we know our sport is complicated, we know our pathways aren't easy to find, and this was this is now highlighted an area that we all have to get together to focus on how we can create a better customer journey for people and a more clear pathway for them. And this was the area that was highlighted um, in the research um, about the racialized experiences and bullying. And this was the part of the report that was really difficult to read, especially when we were going through all the notes from the participants. However, what I want to say is all of them said this is not the experience they have in a riding school landscape or a livery yard. This is the experiences that they have on a daily basis uh, when they go to a supermarket or anywhere they go. So it's more of a societal issue, therefore sporting um, landscape and the government is really trying to focus on this to see how we can solve some of those societal barriers. The key takeaway for us was a few points. I'm just going to mention three of them. As I mentioned, race and class experience are common, so it's just not limited to our sport. Representation and visible diversity matters. They wanted to see people who looks like them. And um, 
Therefore, a lot of them chose some alternative structures, they call them alternative structures, where people from their demographics are getting together to create a community. So they wanted the community to feel that they belonged. And equestrian is socially, culturally, and emotionally valuable. Everyone in the research highlighted, even those who had a lot of bad experiences, they said, when you get to the yard, when you are next to the horse, nothing else matters because horse doesn't judge. Um, so they felt, if, regardless of all, all of the challenges, they want to be involved and they want to create a better pathway for people like them to be involved. There was sets of, there was a lot of recommendations coming out of the research. There was 11 recommendations that the company AKD Solution gave to us to focus on. And um, I'm just mentioning a, a, a few of them here. They were around universal commitment to anti-racist, anti-classist environment and open door complaint and grievance practices for us. So policies are important, although it's boring, but it's important. You have to have those in place to be able to tackle challenges. Leading from the front was raised as a very important area. <clears throat> Make the changes you want to see, so don't expect it to, be, to, to happen. If, as I mentioned at the beginning, every one of us have a role to play in here. And the one that they kept talking about was plan generationally. This is not going to happen tomorrow. You need years and years of practice to build in the culture. So when people from diverse demographics come to our sports, we have, we have created that environment for them to feel that they belong. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do nothing now, but it's, it's just steps by steps and we have to be a little bit patient. So we responded to all of those 11 recommendations they had um, and we committed to write a strategy that is overarching and focus more on inclusion as a whole and not just focus on those un underrepresented group and focus on everyone. What I want to mention here before I move on to the next steps is I'm really proud of our British Equestrian Board but also our council which is consisting of federation members, CEOs and chairs and all of their people so everyone here from the RDA group um, because we encouraged and embraced discussion around diversity and inclusion whereas in a lot of other places, I'm not sure if anyone is a cricket fan here, uh, in, in a lot of other sports, they didn't. They didn't publish the report. They buried some of the evidences, unfortunately, which caused a lot of challenges for them as an industry. So us putting our hand up to, to show our vulnerability and say we know it's not great in some of the areas, but we're committing to change is incredibly important and it takes courage from the leadership perspective. To make the change, we need to be the change, as I mentioned. We can't expect our school to change at grassroots level unless we change at the leadership and decision-making level. Diversity starts in the boardrooms and at decision-making levels, and we have to be bold and brave enough to make tough decisions to change the landscape uh, we have, not just for our sport, for the whole society, because the person you're changing who's coming to your yard or your coaches or your room, they're part of a bigger society. They're going to respect people when they go, as I mentioned, to the supermarket. So it's our little role to play to make a better society as a whole. And what we need to do, there are three things. One is, first of all, create psychological safety, I can't tell you how important it is to make people feel safe to share their experiences with you because unless you know, there's nothing you can do. You can't guess what Tigger next to me, her experiences, I can't. I have a million different layers of intersectionality. I am coming from a Muslim background, I'm a woman, I live in the Middle East and I have neurodiversity. Um, I think I tick a lot of diversity boxes, but I'm a woman. I can only speak about myself, not, not a lot of other people from my background. So we need to ask questions, we need to be curious. Um, we need to create the process, as I mentioned, to be able to tackle some of the issues. As I mentioned, there are going to be difficult decisions that need to be made at some level, and we need to have process in place to be able to tackle those challenges. And finally, be patient in the process to make the change. Just to 
recap pretty much. I'm going to talk about the next step. So <clears throat> we will launch a strategy. We, we kept the same name. We called it the Horses for All strategy. Um, please don't share this vision and mission and um, strategic pillars because it, the, the strategy hasn't been launched yet. It's going to be launched by the end of the month. So it's not even in the embargo uh, situations. Please don't. If you're taking pictures, please don't publish them anywhere. Um, and the, so you can see here our vision and mission as an industry. This is not a British Equestrian um, Federation. It's a federation-wide strategy that we are working on. And these are the six pillars or strategic objectives we are focusing on. As I mentioned, the importance of leadership and governance, the diversity and data indicators. You have to take data and, and know where your benchmark is to be able to measure where you're going to go next. The importance of training, our workforce, our communication, they're all going to be included with a lot of tactics underneath them. And every member body is going to develop an action plan to say how you're going to tackle those areas and how you're going to respond to those, to those um, issues. And I want to finish by saying it's important to remember that solving diversity issues takes time. So please listen, learn and adapt. What we have heard from the Horses for All, which was concluded last year, might not be the same in three years' time. So we need to learn and adapt as we are going along and not think that we've cracked it. We've done one EDI education, I know everything about EDI, I don't need to um, educate myself anymore. It's, it doesn't work like that. It's the same as AI world and the data world. It's just changing, it's ever changing all the time. We all know the benefits of sports um, on people's mental health and well-being. And we are all aware of the added benefits our sports has due to the unique horse and human bond. So let's try to embrace the diversity and uh, include more people in our industry. It's our collective responsibility to make sure everyone can access our offer. Every one of you in this room has a role to play. And let us promise to be responsible, but be curious. Don't, don't shy away from asking questions. If you don't know something, just ask. That's where all the problems lies, is for you to guess in what the issue is and try to tackle it. Just ask. If you don't know, just ask. There is no problem with that. And at the end, I'm going to give you three words. Let's promise to collectively start caring, connecting, and collaborating. Now, I'm going to go first to Tegan. Um, Tegan shared something with me on Monday, and I think it's really important for you to hear around the fact that um, being part of the RDA was really, really good for her, and it was supportive, and everything that she could have ever wanted was given to her in that way. But her story starts really as soon as she left, and I'd just like her to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I feel like I would be in like, the place where you're surrounded by people that are similar to you, that are able to adapt everything to your needs. And the main objective is for you to achieve your goals at the end of the day. And then when I left RDA and I went to BD, I didn't really know much about the pathway or what I was doing, I was learning that the thing that I was doing, but it was totally different because not everyone is on this high. You're now seen as competition, so you're not treated with respect or with graciousness or joy. You're instantly seen as the opposition, and that's something that I think mean, I definitely didn't think that. I was still quite young and probably naive that I live in the world that I, I am going to be treated differently because of my colour. But that was my first time really facing the fact that it, it, was right, it was right there. I was obviously being treated differently to fellow riders. I wasn't given as many opportunities. And 
and my family went to the same way. We had doors slammed in our faces. We, we had questions on that. We were given inadequate information so that I wouldn't get the point that I needed. Um, and I think you know, it wasn't to me kind of nothing small and knowing that this is what I want to do. And reading all the manuals and all the wrong books and everything, I probably wouldn't have got very far. And I think it was about in a year's time I went from the bronze rider, which should be entry level rider to be me, to the gold rider, which is what like Deputy Tippers and B Christian are doing. And it was once I hit that level, you know, I gained the points and I was getting scores, that I gained the respect. People knew that I was good. They couldn't tell me otherwise. They, they, they now wanted me on their team. And it was a complete change, I think, of the environment. Because it went from everyone kind of watching to see whether I go wrong, to watching me to see whether I can beat the top athletes out there. And yeah, it was a real eye-opener to me because I, oh yeah, I'm sat here, I feel quite young, but I'm going up in the world and discovering how people can be quite mean in the world towards people with disabilities and black people. And before Nardier, I never really had it so face on. So when you enter the world outside the world, yeah, it is quite an eye opener, I think. Yeah. Would you say that at that point, when you were trying to get to the level that you've got to now, disability wasn't necessarily your barrier, or was it as well? I think it can be. I think when you are riding for World Cup to Best Odds, they have a similar um, rating system so that your peers, other athletes that are similar to you, that in order to get classified by them, it's a whole other eye ordeal with forever and lots of documents and lots of appointments and you've got to wait probably two years to get your appointment and it's a lot of hassle. But I feel like the, the way that you compete is quite inclusive, but the way that you're treated as a competitor isn't. We still, I mean, even the top athletes can tell you when you turn up to a competition now, there's no same toilets or the disabled toilet has no lock, or there's one disabled toilet for 40 athletes for three days, or there's no pathway to all wheelchairs and people are getting stuck in the field. And quite often the powers are thought of that, so to people like Charlotte, Kilo Dan, and the big athletes, they get the closest stables, the closest car park, they get all the lovely luxuries and we get kind of put aside. And that is something that we are kind of raising to the age of art because we do bring up to the table and we pay the same amount as they do, but we still get treated a lot less than. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of, you get that an eye opener because you, you, would expect, you would expect the kind of human needs to be taken care of, like a toilet and pathway. And a mountain block is another whole argument that we're always having because I'm sure a lot of you know we need a, a decent amount of luck to get the same ride along. And we don't have one that we're doing with to the news. So athletes have to be responsible for getting on their own horse without their own liability. Because the venue don't decide the seat on that block. And quite a lot of time you can see a lot of athletes. So it's quite a hairy thing to watch getting on their horses. A lot of the top athletes horses, they are bronze spring horses, they are high energy, high level. Not necessarily wanting to stand still for a long period of time. So having a seat on that block is really needed. So that's also something that we're trying to get for us. So 
Because, yeah, how many people have gone around with news about the hospital for African patients? And not everyone can do a leg up on their sanitary hand washer. So, <laughs> yeah, you definitely need equal treatment as well. So, for them to realize what our needs are and that's really given to us. Brilliant. And I think that's really important that kind of there's something to be said about the education that all of you can give to your colleagues in those environments as well, because you will be brushing sides with them, you will be kind of connecting with them and speaking to them. And the education that you guys have got can absolutely be used in those areas as well. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about your journey through kind of Paralympic sports and coming through in board memberships. What's your experience kind of been of how you've been treated both by your disability but also by your ethnicity? Um, you know, it's, um, it, it's really interesting to sort of uh, like um, maybe see how you can actually be set aside because of how the eye sees you being different. And I must say, that is something that I experience almost every day, <laughs> you know. So to me, when I wake up, I always say to myself, ooh, so what other hurdle is there today? Mm -hmm. How am I going to be navigating today? And I think it, it's, it's not that, um, that, that I'm sort of like willing to sort of like wake up and navigate things. It's just society. Mm -hmm. It's the way society is built, you know, it's sort of like, society was never built with disability in mind. And what I mean is, in every area, you know, when we come about, when we, when we talk about um, academics, when we talk about employment, when we talk about sitting on the boards, and it is just totally different. I remember when I was first um, appointed to, to sit on the UK Athletics Board, and the people was just really surprised. You know, people, everybody was asking, why are they bringing a black disabled woman on UK Athletics Board? They just did not understand. And I think to them, they were not able to go past a disability, the fact that I am black sitting in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. To them, they must have thought, what is she going to bring on the table? Mm -hmm. But actually, when I sat on the table and my voice was being heard, it made a difference. And there's nothing as beautiful as when you are disabled and you know, female or with a disability, with my intersectionality, if I may say, being put on a board, sitting around the table, and really amplifying the voices of people. It, it is more rewarding than you sitting there because an organization wants to tick a box, you know? And you know what, Jess, I am so quick to know when an organization wants to tick a box using me. And that is when I always say, no, thank you. You know, I will not do that. You know, I, I say to people that it took me a long time before I found my voice. Mm -hmm. Because of all these three, you know, I should call them three crosses, but I've learned to, to, to use them for the advantage or for, for the good of everyone. So the three crosses that should be so heavy to carry being female, being disabled, and being black, I always say to people, I was just lucky, you know? I was just lucky that I've got these three things, and it's the three things that really have given me a platform where I am able to, I don't want to say speak for the, for the black women or the disabled, because everyone has got a voice, but sometimes people's voices are silent, so I say, these, are, they've enabled me to really amplify other voices. And the, the crazy thing is, since I found that voice, I'm not going to let anyone silence me. Because I just know the importance of, for example, sitting on a board and talking about inclusion, for example, you know, talking about representation. When I was growing up, I never, I never had any person that I would look at you know, as a role model. You know, I grew up in, in Africa, you can, you can guess from my accent. I still don't speak like the king, but <laughs> so, <laughs> growing up in Africa, I never saw anybody who looked like me. 
So what were my aspirations? I never saw a disabled doctor. I never saw a, you know, a high elite person with a disability. What I saw was the disabled people who were begging in the streets, disabled people who were only being given pats on the back and being told, oh, well done, oh, you can do this, and you know, oh, you've done this, oh, aren't you so brave? And I said, well, it's not about being brave. I just want us today to understand that really, when you are different, or when society looks at you as different, all you want is opportunity. And once you're given that opportunity, you know, like me, once I was given the opportunity to sit on different boards, then I started to challenge their perception of being female, you know, being disabled, speaking this accent. And then they just sort of realized that we are all so different in our ways, but together we bring so much on the table. Can you imagine if we all looked the same and we all sounded the same? The world would be so boring. And, and I think with that in mind, I just realized that I'm a very important addition to this board that I sit on. And I never allow anyone just to tick a box to say, oh, we've got a woman. Oh, and then we've got a disabled woman. Ooh, and then, you know what? She's, she's that, you know? She's a black one. No. And I think maybe just to finish off uh, with your question, just I say that inclusion is an art. Mm -hmm. And diversity is a fact. Mm -hmm. And this thing is just no way we can have one without the other. And I think it's really important around what you're saying about taking back control. <coughs> as a disabled person, you and I, I've, I've experienced this as well, you quite often get told what you can and can't do, mm -hmm. rather than being given the choice of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And being able to be told that, to a, an, an organisation that instead of them saying to you, oh, you're not right for us, to have the power and the choice to turn around and go, do you know what? I don't like you, and you're not right for me, mm. is probably far more powerful than anything else that we're likely to have. Mm. And I just wish that we could kind of install that into everybody um, to be able to take back that power and that choice. I wanted to kind of know as well, and kind of the voice that you've got is powerful. Have you kind of supported that through RDA with uh, where you've joined, with the people that you're working with? I met some of them yesterday and this morning. They seem absolutely amazing. And kind of, have you supported them to see things in a different light or in how you might have needed things to engage with other people? Uh, do you know what? That, that is a lovely question. I'll just start by saying um, this. Um, when I went sort of like to try and drive or to try and do something, there were these hurdles that we're still going through, you know, because uh, I can't sit on a horse in a different way, or I shouldn't be able to do this. Which saddle should I use, and all that? And I'm saying to them, I just want to sit on a horse. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to be able to, you know, to, to sit on a horse and be able to enjoy and you know ride. But there are all these hurdles that we have to go through. And I think because they've not had many of of Anne, it also it is also a learning process for them. So they are now saying to themselves. How do we navigate this? Because Anne is here now, and there's going to be so many ants coming after, you know, after her. How are we going to do this? So it's it's sort of like we are all learning together. Do you know, like when you have a baby, you know, a first time mom, and you really don't know how to change nappies. You, God, I'm really talking a lot about pools. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'll talk about different things. Now. But. We, we are all learning, you know, we, it, it's, it's a learning process for, for them. They've had people with different disabilities, but they've not had anyone with a disability such as mine. Mm -hmm. But also, let's remember, I want to be a little bit more competitive. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want to sort of like go and sort of just do 50 meters. I really want to be competitive, but I also want people to, to see me riding uh, or doing something, you know, with the horses. And I want people from my ethnic background, for example, or people who thought this is only something that the rich can, can access, for example, or you don't need to look like this to access. I want people to know that this is a very inclusive sport and just go present yourself the way you are. And you'll meet people who are willing 
to sort of like be large with you. And I think that is the beauty of uh, of RCA. When I went to Brook Cottage Farm, and they're like, yes, let's try this, you know, let's do this, let's try that. And I just feel so accepted. Mm -hmm. They never looked at me and say and said, no. They sort of said, okay, so what do we do? How do we make it possible? And that's the beauty of it. Brilliant. And I think that really lovely thing to kind of take away that all of you guys do really well. You don't see the problem in front of you, you look for the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one thing that you can teach so many people within the sports sector. Um, so, Susanna, your story is slightly different. You kind of had a very um, supportive journey through everything that you've done. And I just wondered if you would talk about how you, what stages you went through to ensure that people were okay with what they, what was going to happen, with what then did happen, what then the reactions were, how, and what was that journey like for you? What did you have to do and what were the steps you needed to put in place for it? And one back a, a, a bit before that, because I'm an older person that's transitioned. I've spent all my life reading about it and stuff that I couldn't do. I did try once my, when I was in my 30s and I scared myself to death <laughs> and, and thought, I can't, I, I'm simply not brave enough. And so I got to <coughs> from it. And I just thought, I, it's buried, I'd like to bury it again, please. I can't, it's this. But I've done that on the basis of a fairly high achiever academically. Um, I, I've, the people that I've worked with always, so it's almost like, you see, you can switch from being a bit sarcastic, a bit flip, into somebody who is really quite penetrative. And you're more likely to encounter them being one of the trans men. So when I went, finally, after a great long waiting list, to the Gender Identity Clinic in London, this is just before COVID finished it all, and a two-year waiting list extended to a five-year waiting list, I was outnumbered four to one by young genetic females avidly taking notes of the <coughs> awful surgery that is the female to male. I thought the male to female stuff was a bit gruesome, but you, it will put you off eating liver and bacon ever again, <laughs> honestly, honestly. And I just looked at them and I thought, respect. <laughs> so okay, with that background, I now are talking to some folk who also, nearly everybody I spoke to, had uh, helped me through the grief of Jill's death. Uh, a year earlier. So, uh, with that in mind, a, sort of, a bit of a unique mix, I thought, right, okay, loads of trans people decided to go away from where they'd been before, change on the way, um, it might be a year or so, and then present themselves to someone new somewhere else and start all over again. And I thought, no. Because it's almost like saying to my friends, my neighbours, the British carriage driver, my DA folk, thanks for all the support, bye. I'm not going to do that. They're good people, I am going to trust them. And so what I said to, uh, started off with the, the closest members and a few key folk, the, the guy who chaired British carriage driving, uh, uh, the, the, the woman that ran uh, the Star Helicopter Driving Group that some of you. And so what I said then was, all right then, uh, if you think there are a few problems, my, one of your neighbours said, well, it's going to be a problem, it's going to be a problem, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> and and uh, one of them, um, just, he, he was he's a bit deaf. He went belting around the village, apparently saying, he's, he's got a new woman in there already. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Peter said his wife, she's just still. It's going to be a woman, so I get another one. <laughs> he still talks to me about good chap, good chap, good chap. <laughs> but, uh, it's no malevolence in it, it's just he's getting a bit senile, that's all it is. And another chap who they thought, he's a co bunch of the old terror show, Montesford, the British Legion, where I'm also a committee member of the, on the risk, it's not a diversity group, that's the British Legion of the thing. And um, I won't say exactly what he said because you're far too sensitive. It's never heard words like who or anything beginning with that. Um, but he's, he's tall though. And I said to him, Come, there's something I want you to hear from me rather than from the gossip. And I told him, uh, this is in the Legion, and he turned around and said, That 
fantastic. <laughs> and he said, yeah, great, great on you, good, good, you, good, yeah. And he said, I know there's some people here that won't like it. You tell them you couldn't use green on leather, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, but if it's, and he said, it's mine, it's a civil note. I said, you can't listen to this. <laughs> That's more or less what, what happened. Well, then I thought, hey, look, you read the literature, you read anecdotes, you go on, on, on uh, social media, and you find the horrific grief that folk have got. Now, another thing, my parents died. I never had a job of breaking into them. Now, okay, I've not had that experience. I think we got that's a blessing. I think they would have, my dad would have been supportive, but I think he'd probably be disappointed, but he would never have said so. My mother would have said so. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, that, that, that bit was spared me, so I, I have lived a charmed life. Um, one thing we did with our group, though, we said, right, okay, we've got some vulnerable folk here who we think of their mental uh, state. Who would be surprised and maybe upset? And I've got some with autism. We have to play that very carefully. You know, Godfather, God, uh, Godmother's going to come in. Uh, and we also translate that into Dutch, because, you know, so, <laughs> yes, he's, he's, he's caught, quartering, he's caught French. Up half Dutch. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I speak to him in French because he can understand he can get English from anywhere, but he's only going to learn Dutch in Holland. So I can see him over there. So uh, I had to prepare him because he, he screams and, and goes completely mental if something that he doesn't like uh, uh, is supposed to be. So I have to think about that with some of our drivers. Um, and there was only one person we thought might be a little bit better about it, but we thought that the state is such that if I just came in as a new volunteer, and that's the only time I sort of presented myself as someone new, mm -hmm. is to her. And the, the thing about her particular kind of autism, so she's got your name, she's uh, her name, she's got this got a wonderful, I wish I'd got that. It's a beautiful name. But uh, she was the only person that we had to have a kind of strategy for. Mm -hmm. But all the rest of the time, um, folks said, Actually, we're worried we're going to offend you. I thought, is this me going to snap at them? <laughs> See the scary person again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it never worked like that. So, one occasion, they could be sitting coming down the pub with Bonnie Mo, um, 222 yards door to door. <laughs> this is long ago, that can't be done. <laughs> never mind. Uh, but they see me coming, and I could say, almost like predict it. Look, look. It's, 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 it's Susanna, right? And then Susanna, Susanna, Susanna. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, hi, Susanna, do you want a drink? I couldn't, I never bought myself a drink for six months. <laughs> but then, you know, you, you rush it away, and, and the next person gets up and, and goes around and sees you at the person. Right, right, you want another drink, John? And, and so says, he's not John, he's not he. And, and, and all of this. <laughs> and so they've got a pint pot put there, right, okay. There's a pound in there for every time you get the wrong name, the wrong gender. <laughs> I raised 32 quid for the RDA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But none of it was malicious, it was yeah. accidental, and they've mm -hmm. learned. Yeah. We'll say a dog knows when you've trod one to tell accidentally. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's absolutely no point. But I thought, where are all these haters? Mm -hmm. I only had one guy I used to spend the rules with, our uh, parents. Uh, and, um, uh, apparently, if you read some particular bit of the, the Old Testament, which I haven't got in my Bible, um, <laughs> that says God doesn't like transgender people, it is in there, <laughs> and so he doesn't want anything to do with me. I just stopped at the bit that said, uh, love thy neighbour. <laughs> I don't think I've got that far, sorry. <laughs> yes, can I just say, listening to Susanna, I mean, what is really coming out is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of inclusion, Susanna, and I think to me, really, Inclusion should not just be about bringing people into the spaces that already exist. Mm -hmm. I think, it, rather, it should be about creating new spaces yeah. mm -hmm. and sort of like allowing people, you know, diverse people in, you know, gender, race, you know, whatever they decide to be, to come and fit. So it's like don't, don't build blocks or don't build ditches or rooms and bring those people in and say. I'm fitting you here, I'm fitting you there. Because to me, I feel if we do that, then you want to bring people and it's like, we can't fit in this space. Even like when you transition, it's like, 
you had to go and find a new space. Yes. You couldn't fit in the old space of who you were. Mm -hmm. You had to fit in that new place and in the new space. And I think that is the beauty of it. You know, that, that is the beauty of just letting people come as they are. Brilliant. I, I, I'm really sorry. We are absolutely running out of time. But I could listen to these guys all afternoon. I don't know about you. There's a couple of things that I just wanted to point out before we go to questions, and I think we can only probably have one or two. But um, I wanted to let you know that there are, if you want to know more about inclusive diversity and inclusion, there is training that I uh, put together, and Susanna has written it. It's fantastic. It talks about it from a very disability perspective mm -hmm. and takes the intersectionality across that. I would absolutely advise you and all of your colleagues that you work with in the centres to, to apply and to go on it. But also, if anybody's kind of got any twinklings in the back of their head that they'd like to support with this area, we are also looking for tutors. So please bear that in mind as well. Um, the other thing that I think that we've got a really big um, ask around is for you to make that inclusive culture space. Now there's a saying around, you can be discriminatory, you can be inclusive, but then you can actively be inclusive. Now being inclusive is just how I say, well, everybody's welcome and anybody can come here, but nobody actually ever feels that they can and that it's not really a space that they can go into. By you being actively inclusive means that you're going out into the community, you're actively engaging with them to say to them, look, we need volunteers, we have some few spaces, don't laugh at me, I know that's not necessarily the case. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you need volunteers. So why can you not start looking for volunteers within those spaces, which will then actively help you start to represent what the community around you looks like. Um, and finally, you guys have a really, really big role to play in telling other people within your sector how to do things right how to be inclusive. So what Tegan's experienced as she's gone out from the RDA into the international, that information has to come from you. And I think also it would be really good if you could start to support the riders to understand what that transition is going to be like. Because it's night and day. You go from being really supportive and hugged and loved into a brutal situation. And I think that that education needs to come through a little bit more as well. But I just wanted to thank the panel. Um, you've been amazing. Just the information that you've had come out to me has been really, really helpful. Is there any questions that anybody would like to put forward? And I'll just say we're really short on time. I'm so sorry, we've run over massively. So you have been amazing, but we're going to keep the questions very, very short, if that's OK. I a short one. <coughs> it is a short one. Oh, no. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, I wanted just to pick up on something that Anne said at the very beginning, which was, I identify as disabled. And, and we were not going to have the answer debate, but that is such a, that one word within this community, everybody has so many different opinions of whether we should be riding the disabled association. Some say, if it wasn't disabled in there, I wouldn't be able to do this. Whereas others say, oh, I'm not disabled. And it's just one of those good going forward. I think we could probably spend a whole day workshopping this. And I just thought it was just interesting to hear you straight there. That was really something that was so important to you. And I just think that, you know, at the future date, we can probably chat about this. But I think that's interesting to hear that some people say thank you. But all of you, brilliant. Just quickly, I mean, disabled is in the dictionary. And we should never be afraid to be who we are, you know, because there's no way I can run away from being disabled. I am disabled. But does, you know, it doesn't take away the real I. So it, it is fine to use the, the word disabled. Some people say differently able, oh, I'm not really disabled. I'm like this, I'm like that. It's just like me saying, well, I'm not black, today I'm blonde. <laughs> no, I am disabled and I am proud. Brilliant. I hope you're not joining me in giving the guidance.